My special guest today is Dr. Tabitha Barber. She has devoted her life to giving women a voice and a choice when it comes to their health and well being. As a young girl, she struggled with self esteem and identity issues, dealt with peer pressure, and survived the ridicule and stigma of becoming a teenage mother. As she shared in her first published book titled From White Trash to White Coat, The Birth of Catherine's Purpose, those events led Tabitha to finding her purpose in life. With perseverance and grace, she was able to redirect her path in life and become a successful physician. Dr. Tabitha Barber is a triple board certified in obstetrics and gynecology, menopause, and functional medicine. She has the unique situation of being licensed to practice medicine in over half the country, so you have the ability to work with her virtually. She's the host of the Functional Gynecologist podcast, where she shares her wisdom and knowledge with women everywhere to reclaim their health. She's also a keynote speaker, mentor, medical director, wife, mom, and grandma. By incorporating functional medicine into her women's health practice, she's able to provide women with the tools they need to optimize their health and happiness, which in turn allows those women to pursue their purpose in life. All right, everyone, thanks for jumping on. And like I said in the intro, I have an amazing guest today. We have talked in the past and we just kind of click. just like soul sister. So this is going to be a great, great conversation. So this is going to be a game changer for you. And you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. The latest introduction, the latest member of the family to the fixer line is metabolism fixer. And this, oh my God, I formulated this just for all my people out there that need to lose weight, that need help in the weight loss department, that can't lose weight no matter what they do, that feel like they have a slow metabolism And it might be thinking of trying all those peptides out there. You know, the Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss peptides. Or even if you're on them already and you're like, man, these are really expensive and I'm still not losing weight. Add in metabolism fixer. Here's what I did. I took the power of T2, which increases your basal metabolic rate while you are sitting there watching Netflix. You're burning fat while you're watching Netflix. I combined it with a very unique patented ingredient called Suppressa. Suppressa has multiple clinical trials backing its efficacy in reducing your appetite, decreasing snacking, and providing way more control over your food intake. It is amazing. We also see improved emotional well-being, just decreased food cravings all around, reduced hunger, and weight management. Add on top of that, we have green tea extract, we have purple forest purple tea extract, both of which affect the metabolism in a very positive way without the jitters of normal fat burning supplements out there from the 1980s and 90s, right? The ones that made you feel like you're having a heart attack. You will not have that in any of my supplements, thyroid fixer or metabolism fixer. But metabolism fixer, oh yeah, we kicked it up a notch. It is in powder form. So you can drink it through your day. It's going to flavor your water. We got orange crush and refreshing citrus. I love them both. It is going to keep you under control all day long. So you throw a couple scoops in your water bottle in the morning, throw a scoop or two in your water bottle throughout the day. You will have fat burning and appetite control the entire day for what? An eighth of a price of the peptides? Oh my God, you can't go wrong. So grab some metabolism fixer today. Please let me know how you do on it. I am super excited for you. Super excited. Dr. Tabitha, thank you so much for jumping on to the podcast to talk to my listeners. We're going to dive into hormones and thyroid and toxins and all that good stuff. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. I think every woman probably will need to hear this episode, honestly. Definitely. Definitely. So I, I read your bio And as I was reading it, first of all, amazing story. I mean, just having a child as as a young girl and still pursuing all the degrees that you have, I mean, that's amazing. 
Uh, yeah, it's a little bit crazy. I never, you know, planned it that way. It's just the journey that life took me on. But having my daughter was actually the driver of me finding my purpose and wanting to help other women have a voice and a choice because I had such a bad experience, you know, in the healthcare system. And so, you know, I, I just think we need to always look for the silver lining in our, in our pain, you know, find our purpose. That's true. And it usually is a pain to purpose story. I mean, so many, as you know, in this space and in interviewing practitioners and doctors everyone has gone through something that led them to helping others and passing it on. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I just, I'm so grateful that I went through what I went through because it really opened my eyes to a different potential for my life. You know, I was going to work at the gas station the rest of my life. I, I didn't do 12th grade. I mean, I pretty much, my life was set in stone, but then having these, you know, um, adversities happen, you, and you have to have faith, you have to have faith, and you, your eyes will be opened, and you will see that there's a, a path out of that, there is a way to create any kind of life you want. And people always ask me, like, how did you possibly do it? You know how I just kept seeing my future. I just kept visualizing how I wanted my life to be and not how it was. I didn't get stuck up in the fact that I was on Medicaid and food stamps and, you know, couldn't afford a car and that kind of stuff. I just kept envisioning being a successful doctor, having the the stuff and, you know, having the reputation and helping people and, if you believe it, it will manifest. I I truly believe that. I believe that as well. Yeah. So this is great. This is not only educational on, uh, for women on hormones and thyroid, this is also inspirational. I mean, this is an inspirational interview because think of how many people become a slave to their adversity that, that uh, they allow that adversity to hold them back and almost use it as a, as a subconscious excuse. Yeah, you really have to visualize what you want and see yourself overcoming whatever adversity life has given you. Well, and let me tell you, like, I wanted this whole scenario and I made it happen, right? Like 20 years later, here I am a successful OBGYN with, you know, a super successful practice, patients begging me to deliver them when I'm not on call and all of these things. Yeah. And I realized like, oh my gosh, here I am again in a situation I don't want to be in and I need to create a new life. And so that's how I got into the functional medicine space and left that cushy job and world that I had created because I knew it was time to grow again. And those are painful, hard decisions. And, you know, but it's so worth it when you just step into what God's got planned for you. So it's pretty awesome. I love that. I, I totally love it. And, and that's just so true. I mean, I have been same, well, not the same path as you, but similar in that you, I'm allowing God to lead me down whatever path he has planned. And I, I would have never expected to be where I am today and be helping the amount of people I am today. If you would have asked me 15, 20 years ago. So exactly. that's, yeah. It's amazing. And I'm so happy to have you in this space. People are, are, are blessed to have you in this space helping because, as you know, being in conventional medicine before, doctors are closed off. And I, I want to start with estrogen because I think that's the almost like the, the misunderstood hormone. It's either demonized as being bad and it's going to cause breast cancer or it's elevated to, well, everybody needs it. And it's like, well, no, no, not everybody, because we don't want you to go estrogen dominant. So can you give us like the, the 101 on estrogen and how it applies to, to women and how you see it in your practice and use it and what you look, look at in, in patients? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I think that's, this is a great place to start because honestly, 
that's what we hang our hat on. We think that women's lives are controlled by estrogen and that there's really no other factors at play. You know, honestly, that's what I was taught as a conventional gynecologist. Like, we need estrogen to reproduce and keep us feeling normal and functioning. And then when estrogen drops at menopause, you need to replace it and it will fix all the symptoms. And I've just come to realize after seeing thousands and thousands of patients over the past 15 plus years, that's not the case. Like estrogen is almost never the main driver of the issue. So what I want women to understand is, you know, we are cre producing and circulating estrogen all the parts of our month. You know, we typically have a 28 day cycle for the first five to seven days. Our hormones are low. We're having our bleed. We're shedding that lining, but we're always making a little bit of estrogen in different forms from the ovaries, from the adrenal glands, from our fat cells. And there's also major players of progesterone and testosterone and insulin and thyroid and cortisol. The, they all have to be in this symphony together and playing in this beautiful harmonizing way together. And estrogen can easily dominate that and create chaos, but it's never usually estrogen that needs to be fixed or replaced. It's the other players. So what I'd love for women to understand is that when I went through training, I was taught progesterone is for pregnancy and uterus protection. Like I'm just being honest here right now. We, di we don't really understand progesterone in the conventional medicine world. And, you know, I don't blame anybody like, but once you know better, you do better. Right. So once I started to understand what a key player progesterone is in keeping you mentally balanced and hormonally balanced and feeling good and sleeping, it's like our anti anxiety hormone. So estrogen's like antidepressant. It gives you energy. It gives you motivation. That's why you feel like going out and kicking ass in the world after your period's over because your estrogen spikes up and you're like, okay, let's go conquer the world and do everything I couldn't do last week because I was exhausted. But progesterone has to come in and balance that. Otherwise, you're just going to be wired all of the time and you're going to start to feel anxious. And so progesterone is going to come in and be like that anti-anxiety hormone. It's going to help you sleep. It's going to help keep your weight in check. You know, a lot of people want to blame weight on um, menopause and not enough estrogen when in fact it's oftentimes too much estrogen causes weight issues and you can't manage your weight. And so much of that has to do with progesterone and testosterone, keeping that estrogen in check. So it's really complicated in that way. But what I want women to understand is the worst part about the estrogen dominance is when you get in your forties, you know, early fifties, Estrogen starts not being this beautiful, smooth roller coaster that goes up and down slowly with progesterone, but it starts like spiking. It's like up and down. It's like that horrible ride at the carnival that just shoots you up and then drops you back down because you're ovaries are trying to spit out those last few eggs before you're done, you know, being reproductive. And so you get these spikes of estrogen in trying to push those last few eggs out. And those don't feel good. That's what feels like ripping your partner's heads off or screaming at your kids or going on crying jags and not being able to control your weight is this estrogen all of a sudden is just on this spike up and down. And it's really hard to manage that during perimenopause if you're only focusing on estrogen. You can't chase this crazy tail up and down. You have to balance the other hormones to keep that in check. And, and then you can have a nice smooth transition into menopause. Mm -hmm. And it amazes me too, how many doctors only test estrogen. I was actually, I, I, I went to my doc the other day 
And I, no fault of hers. I think it was just her assistant that was doing like the typing in. And I made the mistake, and she, she's a friend of mine too. So I made the mistake of saying, hey, can we just you know, check my hormones? I, I just want to, I want to check them out. And I just said hormones. Well, on the lab order, I got estrogen, LH, FSH, maybe DHEA. I don't know. But there, was, there wasn't testosterone, and there wasn't even progesterone. So yes. I was like, are we forgetting that women have other hormones? Yeah. And we aren't necessarily testing them at the right time of the month because, as I mentioned, they change every day of that 28 day cycle. And so if you check your, get your hormones checked on day seven, the reference ranges that you need to be using are totally different than if you check it on cycle day 21, that type of thing. And so it's really imperative that you go to a provider who knows how to interpret those results because you cannot go based on the lab values given by the lab company. Mm -hmm. Those are for disease purposes. Like if you're outside of those ranges, you might have an adrenal tumor or an ovarian tumor or something driving that major out of range dysfunction. So you need a provider who's going to understand what those results mean and know when to test them, you know? So like you mentioned, you got the FSH and LH. We like to check for those if we're worried about perimenopause, if you're starting to skip periods, if you're acting like you are going into menopause, because those are brain hormones. Those brain hormones talk to your ovaries and your ovaries respond by making more or less progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen. And so knowing what that conversation is doing is helpful to see where you're at in the process, but realize that it's not a light switch. Menopause doesn't get flicked. You know, the light switch just doesn't get turned off. This is like a dimmer and somebody's playing around with the dimmer for years on end. And so your FSH and LH levels can look different at different days of the month and different months of the year, depending on what's going on. I've had so many Doctors tell patients, oh, you're menopausal because they did one lab value one time and, you know, and that's doing women a disservice because then when they have a period two or three months later, they're freaking out that they have cancer or whatever else because they weren't really evaluated in their entirety in a complete way. So please find someone who understands what they're ordering. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, do you have a, a day of the, the month or day of the cycle that you prefer women get their hormones tested? So if I'm looking to see basically, are you ovulating? Do you make the progesterone and testosterone and estrogen the way you should? Like general cycle health, you want to capture that around day 21. So if that's you having a regular 28-day cycle, that's assuming that. If you're worried about infertility and you're trying to find out ovarian reserve and your brain's response with FSH and LH, then you're looking more at cycles day three and 10. So it depends on what your goals are and your reasons for it. And then you have someone who's not cycling anymore. She's low-level menopausal then you can check it at any time because those levels are more a consistent. They're not a cycling up and down type of situation. So it really does matter why you're getting them drawn. Okay. Yeah. And you shouldn't be on a birth control pill because if you're on synthetic hormones, like a birth control pill, that is suppressing your own communication between your brain and your ovaries. It's called the HPO axis, the hypothalamic thalamic pituitary ovarian axis, you are not making your own hormones. You are not actually having a period. You are taking synthetic hormones that are causing that lining in your uterus to grow and shed every month. So you are not cycling. You are mimicking a cycle. And if you get your hormones drawn during that time, it's meaningless. It tells me that you are taking that pill. That's all that I'm getting from that test. It's kind of like you with the thyroid. If someone's on levothyroxine or Synthroid, 
and you check a TSH and free T4 and they're in range, that tells me you took your pill and you're doing, you know, you're taking your medicine and your brain heard that response. That's all the information that you're getting. So it's really not helpful. I'm glad you brought up synthetic hormones because I'm, I'm going to tie this back to what I said about estrogen in the beginning and it being demonized. I, I think, and, and you can speak on this, didn't it get the bad reputation from the use of, forget the horse urine one, Premarin. Premarin, thank you. Didn't that really start the whole negative outlook around estrogen and cause women to then fear it and, and avoid yes. it? Yeah, so this is really important to understand. You know, there was a huge study done called the Women's Health Initiative. And there's also another nurse's study, two big studies that went on that were trying to evaluate the safety of hormone therapy in menopausal women. So they gave women either Premarin, which is a conjugated equine estrogen made from horse urine. So it's a synthetic form. It's not identical to the chemical we make or Prem Pro, which is the conjugated equine estrogen plus a synthetic progestin, which acts differently than our natural progesterone. And so we had thousands of women on these two hormones. The average age of the woman in the study was 64. So she was already 13 years past her menopausal date when she started this medication. And you can imagine that after menopause, you already start developing heart disease and um, dementia and bone loss and all these other issues. And then you re-add hormones that your body hasn't seen for 13 years, you're going to have some adverse outcomes. The problem happened with, they released the preliminary results and they said that the estrogen caused blood clot, stroke, heart disease. The Prem Pro with the synthetic progestin causes breast cancer and colon cancer, and everybody freaked out. No one stopped to think about the factors of the study, the fact that we are only testing synthetic hormones, the fact that we're not using the correct patient population. We would never start a 65-year-old woman on hormones that's been, you know, menopausal for that many years. So it took us 15 plus years to finally come to the understanding and agreement, you know, in our societies of like OBGYN and menopause societies and everything else I'm a part of to acknowledge the major faults in those studies, but the damage is done. You know, women have been scared. They have been filled with fear that any kind of hormone replacement must cause cancer and blood clot and stroke. And the crazy part in my mind is that those are the same hormones that we put in birth control pills, and yet we have no problem giving them to women before menopause when we know they cause blood cancer, blood clots, stroke, and breast cancer. We refuse to admit it because it's big pharma. And that part I find very frustrating. You know, I, I don't want to tell people not to take the birth control pill. It's what got me through medical school and prevented me from having another baby for 17 years. Like it's, you know, I believe that we have a choice and we should be able to be on it. But the problem is we're using it for non-birth control related issues and we shouldn't be. And now we're seeing the repercussions of that. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I'm with you. If I meet with a patient and I ask, are you on this for pregnancy protection? And if they say yes, like, well, listen, I don't want you to have a baby when you don't want to. So in that case, what are we going to do? But if, if a woman says, oh, well, you know, I was put on that because of heavy periods. And no, 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 because that's synthetic. So speak a little bit on the difference between synthetic. You, you brought it up, but I want you to dive deeper. Synthetic hormones like that in birth control or IUDs and natural, just like what's in our body hormones. 
Yeah, so you can get more bioidentical, which means it's chemically the same as the kind that your body makes. That's what bioidentical means. It's not that we're actually extrapolating hormones from people and giving them to other people, right? It's that they chemically act the same as the ones that we make in our body. And so there are safer alternatives, not necessarily for birth control, Big Pharma hasn't gone that route, but there are safe, there are non-hormonal alternatives for birth control that you can do if you don't want to be on the birth control pill, which we can talk about why in a second. But, you know, especially for perimenopausal and menopausal women, there are safer options. Estradiol is the circulating form of estrogen that we make when we are reproducing. And so we make estradiol, estrone, and estriol. Those are our two, our three big ones. Estradiol can be taken in an oral form as a pill, but here's the problem. When we take it orally, we have gut bacteria that actually turn it into the form estrone, which we don't love before we even absorb it into our bloodstream. So we do see an elevated risk with oral estradiol, even though it's quote unquote bioidentical. So I prefer women to get it in a patch or a cream form because you're bypassing that gut. You're also bypassing the liver, which can um, increase your risk of blood clot and stroke. So if you take estradiol in a pill, I'm sorry, in a patch or a cream form, it's quite safe. You can do it as long as you need to. And women should not fear those risks. You know, you need to be evaluated properly. Obviously, you need to have your medical history done, your family history, see what your blood sugar looks like and all those other risk factors and then make that individualized decision. But you shouldn't fear it. You really should not. Um, And as a conventional gynecologist, I was trained, if you have a uterus, you need progestin so that you don't have unopposed estrogen because unopposed estrogen can lead to uterine hypertrophy, the growth of that lining and uterine cancer. Mm -hmm. So the problem comes in if you don't have a uterus, say you had a hysterectomy, they don't give you the progesterone and it doesn't feel balanced to only be on estrogen. So many women still are complaining of symptoms. Their hot flashes might be better, but they're still anxious and not sleeping and have weight issues. And that's because they need progesterone or testosterone to balance them out. Mm-hmm. Okay, so start with, let's start with progesterone and then go to testosterone, one of my favorite hormones. So progesterone is like you said, the balancing hormone. I've heard it, just like you said, it usually comes from the spouse or the kids first that they say, why is mom being so bitchy? Like, what is wrong with you, honey? Why, why do you have two today? (laughs) And that's usually the, the lack of progesterone. So yeah, let's talk about it. So you, you want to use the bioidentical form again, correct? Yeah. And I mean, ideally you want to just make your progesterone. So when we ovulate around cycle day 14, What's left over in our ovary where the egg popped off, that area called the corpus luteum makes progesterone. So if you don't ovulate, you're not going to have hardly any progesterone. So that's key number one is you do want to ovulate. Number two is progesterone is the main ingredient for cortisol, our stress hormone. So if we're pumping out cortisol all day, we have to steal our progesterone to make that cortisol. And so if you're constantly like high stress, running around crazy life, you're not going to have any progesterone. So first of all, get your stress in check. (laughs) But, you know, a lot of women do supplement progesterone in their mid to late 40s to get them through that transition in a smoother way. And that's totally reasonable. I mean, we deserve to feel good and be amazing, right? So you can take progestin orally. It doesn't have the same risks as estrogen. It does, it's not metabolized the same way, but it has to be progesterone. Yes. It, it can't be a progestin. Right. 
that is what causes breast cancer and other issues. And so we want progesterone. An oral form is very well tolerated. You take it at bedtime, you can almost always sleep better and have more energy. Every now and again, someone will complain of heartburn or something else, and then you can try a cream. Unfortunately, progesterone doesn't come in a pellet or anything like that. So really the oral form or the cream are the ways to go with that. Um, But for me personally, it's been life-changing. Like all of a sudden when I hit 45, I couldn't sleep. My mind was up. I'm doing the guided meditations. I'm doing the breathing. I'm like processing my thoughts and my feelings and doing all the work, right? Yep. I just needed progesterone. <laughs> it, is. it can be a lifesaver. It can be like an antidepressant. So instead yeah. of going to your doc and getting, getting out of an or Xanax or an antidepressant, do some bioidentical progesterone. Yes. I mean, so many women are like, I don't understand. I've never had anxiety. Why am I so anxious? What is going on? And it's exactly that. Mm -hmm. And before we jump to testosterone, I want to tie estrogen and progesterone and the synthetic into weight as well, because a lot of listeners struggle with weight. And I have to tell you the story and you can kind of speak on this. I had a patient a few years ago and she was seeing a local OBGYN who I absolutely love, very functional thinking. But she went to them and she said, you know, ever since I got the marina put in, I've been gaining weight. And they're like, no, 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 it can't be. It can't be that. It can't be that. I'm like, no, really? I think it, yeah, it was. She had it taken out and she lost 12 pounds in a month. So those synthetic hormones were actually causing weight gain. Do you see that in your practice? All the time. That synthetic progestin acts the opposite as progesterone. So it binds to the same receptor, but it sends the opposite signal. So a lot of women who are on Mirena, Kylena, Skyla, or Depo shots, things like that, they have worsening depression and anxiety, weight gain, mood swings, all worsening insomnia because it's sending the opposite signal that your body wants to hear. You know, I I will tell you, I personally took out my own Mirena because I was suicidal on that thing. Like it just sent me over the edge. It was the worst experience I've ever had. And it, it gave me new empathy for my patients. All of a sudden I was like, you know what? These women are right. We need to listen to them. This, they're not crazy. You know, we're trained to just tell them that's not possible. That's not the case, especially with weight gain. Oh, that's not possible. I see it over and over and over. And and the studies show it, you know, women on Depo Provera shots, they gain an average I don't remember what it was, maybe 23 pounds or something over the course of two years. And it's even higher in African-American women. But we poo-poo it because it's like the answer for everything. You know, you can stop having your periods and worrying about your painful, heavy periods and all that stuff. Just take, you know, get the shot or whatever. And we are just doing them a huge disservice, honestly. It is unfortunate that they're not told the the real side effects so naturally if someone is depressed and anxious they're going to think there's something wrong with them or something else is off in their body or even if they have a thyroid condition they might go back to that and go oh my thyroid must be off yeah oh it's because you're on the synthetic hormones and let me tell you that the morena iud or any of those progestin IUDs, they almost always shut down your HPO access. So the the drug company or the company that makes them touts the idea that you don't grow that lining in your uterus and you don't have a period because the progestin is working locally to prevent that growth. Yes, that is true. But more so than not, it's also true that it shuts down your HPO access. Therefore, your ovaries aren't making your estrogen and testosterone anymore either. And so I often see women who are 
you know, they have these IUDs for five or 10, 15 years, because they just keep getting them swapped out. And their hormones are just more and more suppressed to the point where their testosterone is flatlined, their estrogens flatlined. Now they're having menopausal symptoms through this IUD, and they're only like 35, 40 years old. It's because you are suppressing your own hormone production. So you know, I'm all for birth control. I think it's amazing. It got me where I am, but use it for birth control. If you're having heavy periods, Mirena is a temporary band-aid. It's not the fix and it might worsen things in the long run. Okay. Yep. Exactly. hundred percent agree. So moving to testosterone, I, I love testosterone for men and women and I see too often, well, both sexes get told that they're normal, but their testosterone levels will be low. So guys might be in the tank at 300 and told they're normal, but women can be told that they're normal, but they'll be walking around with a testosterone of maybe 15. Yeah. So what's your take on the importance of testosterone? Oh my gosh, I couldn't agree more. That is like our hormone that gets us motivated to get moving during the day to have lean muscle mass and strength and brain clarity and it's like you know you imagine a very successful fit man who can accomplish stuff that's from testosterone but we need little doses of it too you know and the the problem comes in with there's been people in the past who have tried to like mega dose women, especially, and give them these crazy doses of testosterone. So they have all the side effects that are not common, you know, but at crazy high levels, you can start seeing acne or hair growth on your chin and lip or hair loss where it shouldn't be that type of thing. And so people get freaked out and like, oh my gosh, testosterone's horrible. I, or I don't want to bulk up. I'm a woman. I don't want to be bulky. And it's really not like that. We have a physiologic need for testosterone. Our bodies normally make it. And we even make it after menopause. We continue to make it from our adrenal glands. And so if that level is really low, you are going to struggle. You're going to have more weight gain. You're not going to be able to make any strides in the gym. You know, you're going to keep lifting weights and never see any results. You're going to have brain fog and struggle to like be motivated and do your job and do it well. I see it all the time. And getting your testosterone back up to where it should be it can be such a huge game changer. It can give women their life back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I know what you mean. There are those clinics, like the hormone clinic right, worldwide, right. that that's their kind of claim to fame is we're going to treat every woman by putting them on testosterone and it'll make you feel great. And even if they're using lower doses, women do feel better but these clinics are not, they're not doing a full thyroid panel. I, I saw it with one of my patients. You know, she yeah. went to one of these clinics, she got testosterone prescribed, but they didn't even test more than TSH and T4. So they're not even functional. They're not looking at your thyroid. They're not looking at your progesterone level. They're just testing your testosterone and your estrogen to make sure the test they're giving you isn't converting to estrogen and calling it a day. So where do you like to see women land with testosterone and what kind of testosterone do you like to use? So I'm like you, I need to see the full picture of everything that's going on because I believe all our systems are interconnected and working off of each other. So I want your, you know, adrenal glands functioning well. I don't want you living in a stressed out zone. I want your thyroid functioning well. I want your vitamin mineral status up to par, all of that stuff before we start giving you hormones. Because what I understand is when you just give hormones and you don't deal with the other stuff, you're always chasing your tail. You always you're constantly changing the doses and chasing this symptom and that symptom because you're not dealing with the root cause issue. Sex hormone dysfunction is never the reason. It's always the result. Like, honestly, if I'll just be honest, you know, my whole focus of my career is on hormones, but really 
their imbalance is the result of what's going on in other places. So you've got to do the other work. But I, I think it's reasonable to get your hormones in balance while you're doing that other work, because if you have no energy and motivation and anything else, you can't do the other work. So like I said, you're back to the symphony. So I think women do great with testosterone pellets because it is a continuous level of hormones. It's not like they keep trying to bring that level back up to where they need it to be and then dropping back down to that low range they're at that you can see with creams. Some women respond great to creams. I will tell you, it's so individualized. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to do injections, but the FDA has made it so difficult to prescribe testosterone for women. They've just put hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. It's like they really don't want us to feel well. And, you know, a couple cowboys, like you mentioned, doing crazy things ruined it for all of us. And so now it's super regulated and hard to get for your patients. So I would say if you do a total and free testosterone and you're in the bottom half of that, you know, you mentioned 15, I would say if you're 20 and less, like you probably are really going to feel a lot better getting on something for sure. (laughs) Definitely. I like 40 and above. Now I have had some patients that they had a testosterone of like 100, 120, and they swear no androgenic side effects. They feel great. I'm like, well, then we'll just leave you there. If that's your feedback that you feel fantastic, that's fine. I, of course, would have a full beard and acne at 120, but I think 40 or above is is great. Yeah. And here's the deal, especially with pellets, is you can see a a supra physiologic level, especially if you're checking them right after they get their pellets, because that level does have to equilibrialize. Is that the word? Something like that. It just has to balance out after you get the pellet. And so it's really not helpful to check those initial levels. First of all, you're not going to take the pellet out. Second of all, it's going to come down. And third of all, it's going to scare your regular doctor and they they're going to think something's wrong. So don't even get them checked. Honestly, you should go by symptoms. Like you said, if you're getting too much testosterone, you're going to get acne and hair growth. Or if you're converting it to dihydrotestosterone, that can happen. Some people will give spironolactone or something else to prevent that conversion. So you don't have those side effects. I don't necessarily love giving pills to manage side effects from pills that you're taking and this and that, but it's an individual decision, honestly. So what I want women to realize is there are options more than your typical doctor may have for you. And it's okay to experiment a little bit and see what works for you. Because honestly, we all respond a little bit different. Some women do great on cream and they're like, nope, that's all I need. This is good. Some don't need testosterone at all. And they just are happy enough with their progesterone. You know, everybody's so different. Oh my goodness. It is crazy what the FDA is doing them. I mean, I tell patients they're basically treating testosterone like, like, like a, a narcotic. The drug. Yeah. Like you're on opioids or something like, no, you can't prescribe that. Yeah. Yeah. Huge service. Yeah. Not cool. I was going to say the other thing that, you know, we should probably talk about in relation to the thyroid is how taking estrogen impacts our thyroid. So birth control pills, even bioidentical estrogen, any time that you're taking it, it decreases your conversion of T4 to T3. So a lot of times I will see women get diagnosed with hypothyroidism after they start a birth control pill or after they go into menopause or hormone shifts after pregnancy, anytime your sex hormones are different, you have that potential for your thyroid to go, okay, I got to take on more work and do the brunt of the work and I'm struggling here. So, you know, I think women should realize that the thyroid does 
doesn't go and stop working for no reason. You know, it's like there's always a root cause and sometimes it's hormones. Mm -hmm. I talk about that all the time. Hormonal shifts can, can kind of bring about Hashimoto's. So you might have that genetic predisposition for autoimmune, but those shifting hormones, birth control, puberty, perimenopause, pregnancy, that will all of a sudden just shake your body up enough to go, okay, I'm here now. I'm Hashimoto's. Hi. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You know, for me, it was the stress of being a teenage pregnant girl turning into a mother being on, and then getting on birth control pills You know, when we destroy that lining and cause leaky gut from birth control pills, stress, pregnancy, that can trigger our autoimmune. I see it time and time again. And I don't think that we make the correlation of getting on birth control pills with leaky gut as often as we should. I see that all the time. You know, girls will get put on birth control pills when they're like 13 or 14 because their, their periods are irregular, uncomfortable, they're in sports, they don't want to deal with it, mom puts them on the pill. And then all of a sudden, they start getting eczema and acne and depression and all these other symptoms of leaky gut. And it's that was the trigger that just sent them over the edge. And you know, if more women knew that, they might not jump to the pill as the solution, not, you know, as quickly. Very true. That's a good point. Yeah. And leaky gut is, you know, when we say leaky gut, everybody thinks diarrhea and that's not the case. It's just basically <laughs> breaking down your gut lining and, and reducing your immune system because you're getting antigens into your body that aren't supposed to be there. Right. And if you have the genetic propensity for Hashimoto's, those genes are going to get activated mm-hmm. every time. So now I see a ton of PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome with Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism. Do you see that correlation as well? Yeah. I mean, I just, I see so much of it just more than I did even 15 or 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. It's because of leaky gut, you know, as soon as a girl has an irregular period, she gets these diagnoses, she gets put on the pill for all of these different diagnoses, because that's the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. And we really are just driving this increased intestinal permeability, we're creating food sensitivities, we're activating autoimmune disease, and we shouldn't be. I think PCOS is overdiagnosed personally. I think that people want to have a diagnosis and that is an easy way to explain symptoms. PCOS is a syndrome that you call it polycystic ovarian syndrome. Syndrome means we don't know exactly what's wrong, but there's a constellation of symptoms and you fit into that constellation. So you have this syndrome. And the problem is the name is poorly designated. It's not about ovarian cysts. It's about metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance and androgen excess. And so women get this wrong idea. I have a cyst on my ovary. I must have PCOS. And then they go down this whole wrong pathway. I see primary care providers misdiagnose it because of that. It's just I wish it had a different name. Honestly. Well, aren't they changing the diagnostic criteria? I thought that they were actually thinking of changing the name because you don't have to have cysts on your ovaries to have this syndrome. Correct. So the, the Rotterdam criteria is you have to have two out of three things. You have to have too many androgens on your blood work. So like too much testosterone or DHEAS. You, or you have to have a pearl of it looks like a pearl necklace on your ultrasound, a bunch of little cysts on your ovaries, or you have to have these symptoms of metabolic syndrome, like elevated triglycerides, blood pressure issues, waist circumference, that type of thing. And so you don't have to have all of them. You don't have to have the cysts on your ovaries. But what I want women to understand is we see all those tiny little cysts. Those are actually follicles. That's where you're your eggs live, your potential babies, those eggs are inside of these follicles. We follicle and cyst is interchangeable. 
And every month those start to mature and one of them is supposed to get big enough to pop that egg out. But what happens is because you are driven by androgen excess, those cysts never get big enough to come to fruition. So you don't ovulate. And so you just have all these little follicles sitting around and people get confused when they say polycystic ovarian syndrome and they're told, oh, you have a five centimeter simple cyst on your ovary. Oh my God, I got PCOS or I just had a cyst two months ago. I must have PCOS and they have nothing to do with each other. So the cysts are just a byproduct of what your hormone imbalance is doing. It's not it's not painful. It's not the cause of the PCOS or anything like that. So if women can, and like you said, it's not a criteria that's needed to have PCOS, but it's just a common finding that we see on the ultrasound. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think they'll be changing that up. I see a lot of insulin resistance, but the, you're right. Patients will think, well, I have insulin resistance and I have a couple dark hairs on my chin. So it must be PCOS. I'm like, no, you just have dark hairs on your chin because you have dark hair or, you know, it just plagues us all once in a while, but <laughs> right. <laughs> women. Right. Exactly. You got to get your insulin under control because insulin drives testosterone down the wrong pathway. <laughs> so mm-hmm. exactly. 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 Okay. You talked about testosterone. I want to, we can go. I'm, I, I love this conversation, by the way, this is just amazing. <laughs> I, I could keep going keep going, but I want to get in what I really want to get in before I let you go. DHEA, you mentioned that that's a precursor to testosterone and also plays a role with cortisol. So can you help people understand it? Because a lot of patients are getting DHEA tested and they're very confused that that's high, but testosterone is low but they're looking at their adrenals too. Can you clear that up? Yeah, so DHEA is made in your adrenal glands and it's one of those precursors that can go and be made into testosterone, which can then be aromatized into estrogen, right? And so DHEA, we need a certain productive level of that. And I think about DHEA when I think about cortisol or stress hormone, because they're coming from the same part of the adrenal glands. And so if you're pumping out cortisol to manage your stressors all day to the point where you're fried or flatlined and you can't even make any cortisol because your brain's turned off that pathway and trying to protect you, then it will also downregulate and do the same thing with DHEA. And we need DHEA for an ingredient to make testosterone. So it's not okay to, you know, we call it adrenal fatigue. We say fry your adrenals. That's not really what's happening. You're downregulating a communication cycle that's going on between your adrenals and your brain. But you don't want to downregulate that because you will also stop making DHEA. And so oftentimes supplementing with that can be beneficial if you are flatlined. You know, I see it time and time again, women live their crazy crazy stressed out lives to the point where they're just doing it all, having it all, being it all, going from dusk till dawn to the point where I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to take care of my kids. I don't want to clean the house. I don't want to do my job. I don't like my job anymore. And that is because you have stressed your system out so much that your brain finally said enough is enough. We're, we're turning off this communication. We're down regulating it. We're not going to make cortisol and DHEA anymore. You don't deserve it. You've abused that privilege you're going to bed, you know? And so you're in this flatline state and it affects everything downstream. So imagine that, you know, the dam came down, the water can't flow anymore. So you're not going to make your testosterone and your estrogen, and you're going to see all kinds of symptoms from that. So it's, it's crazy, but it's, it's good to know that there's other options that are non-prescription. You know, a lot of providers who aren't licensed prescribing physicians can help support you. They can give you DHEA and pregnenolone and things like that to actually give you those upstream ingredients, open the dam back up, 
and like let those sex hormones be produced again. Yep, absolutely. And you mentioned pregnenolone. I always feel like that's like the like forgotten stepchild or something. You know, we, we, <laughs> we never test for it. We never talk about it. I know some practitioners don't believe in pregnenolone steel. Some do. So is do you add that into your list of tests to get on a new patient? I personally do not because I have the ability to prescribe hormones directly. I don't need to necessarily work that far upstream. The, the times I have tried to do pregnenolone, I, I see that steel. I see it used to make cortisol. And so unless someone's really proving to me that they've got their stress under control and their, their cortisol production is the where it should be, it's a nice, beautiful 24-hour pattern, and they don't want prescription hormones, yeah, let's do pregnenolone. That's a great option. But you, you do have to be careful because it's like sprinkling it and it could go any which direction. Mm-hmm. I like using it when all the hormones are low. When someone is yes. just in the yes. and they just need total support, their cortisol is flatlined, they have no estrogen, no progesterone, no testosterone, then I like yeah. not even with bioidenticals because it still is kind of supporting the whole system at the top. Yeah, I mean, that would be a great place, you know, scenario of like someone comes off a birth control pill forever and they just have premature ovarian insufficiency. Like their cycle didn't start back up. They're not making anything. It's like, here, let's just sprinkle everything and, you know, see what we can get going. So I like that for that reason. Mm -hmm. Yep. Gosh, this is such, I mean, this, we could talk forever about hormones. They're so complex and they're so fascinating to understand because they play a role in so many different functions of the body and how we feel. And I mean, they're just fascinating to me. I, love I know. Them. And we didn't even talk about the gut and the liver. I mean, we could go on for days. I'm going to have to have you back on. We got to do <laughs> toxins. We got to do gut, liver, hormones being processed in the liver. Um, yeah, no, well, we're going to have you back on for that. <laughs> But my, my last question before we get to how people can find you, this has been, I've actually looked this up and I, I, as much as I know about the hormones, I don't have an answer to this. Why do, why does the rib cage expand in menopause? So even if a woman doesn't gain fat during menopause, she gets that widening of the rib cage. Why does that happen? So your ligaments, your tendons, all of that are affected by estrogen. And when estrogen levels decrease, those are affected and they are not as strong. Those collagen, you know, support structures, everything loosens up. And that would explain, you know, why you're seeing that widening because you're getting loosening of the ligaments. People have are more prone to like ankle sprains and things like that. And you're, you start reabsorbing bone more. And so you get bone loss and you can break bones easily, more easily. So there's a lot of risk factors just by losing your hormones. You know, I mean, I'm a super big advocate for natural menopause and all of that. But I also have this little piece in me, like, we live 50 years longer than we used to and our physiology hasn't caught up yet. We should probably be going into menopause at about 75 or 80. And so now we have to live all of this time without hormones. And we see time and time again that all of a sudden our arteries start to harden when we lose our estrogen, our ligaments become lax, our bones become thinner, our brain doesn't function as well. We have, you know, the synapses aren't functioning. And so there is a good argument for being on hormone replacement, you know, especially if you're a highly productive woman who's like at the epitome of her career and trying to do all the things, you know, we're not on the porch knitting at menopause the way we were. This is totally new for civilization. And, you know, so I think it's an individualized decision. I can't stress that enough. Like I just, I get angry when people are so adamant about one way or another, because they don't have to live in your body and deal with what you have to deal with. I'm not signing up for 
heart disease, dementia, you know, hip fracture. Like I'm not going down that road anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And estrogen in the brain. You made a very good point because yeah, it, it's very oh neuroprotective. Yeah. That's one of the big reasons women come to me is I can't focus at work anymore. I can't remember what I was doing five minutes ago. I can't complete my projects. It's like totally affected from your hormone loss. And you made a good point. I was binging on your podcast, The Functional Gynecologist, and I, I, you said that on one of the shows about now we're going into menopause later and, and maybe, you know, 100 years down the road, our, our genetics will catch up and our physiology will catch up and we'll actually see menopause start in our 70s when it really should be right now. Uh, and, and that's an interesting way of thinking because think about it. Now women are going into menopause and they're dealing with low hormones 20, 25, 30, 35 years. Yeah, exactly. Our great grandmothers didn't live like this. You know, they weren't out conquering the world, trying to do all of this stuff. They were winding down. They were done raising their family. They were being taken care of by their children at this point. And here we are trying to like create successful businesses and be super fit and hang out with our girlfriends and give our spouse attention. And it's just, we've never seen this in the thousands of years that humankind's been in existence. And so we need to give ourselves a little grace, like, hey, I need some support to, to do what I, all this crap I want to do. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Thank you for that. So what would you like to leave our listeners with a little, what's the tidbit and takeaway that they can, that they can have from you? Yeah. So what I try to drill into my patients, because it really is something that you have to accept and embody is that you can't heal a body that you hate. I have women who hate the fact that they're in pain. They hate the way they look. They hate the, the way they feel. And if you don't love that body the way it is at that very moment, you will never heal. You will, you cannot, you would never like hate a child and show that child love. You, you know, you just wouldn't treat any other human being that way, but we do that to ourselves. Like I just, women will sit there and rip themselves part from head to toe and then question why they don't feel good it you can't do that you have to love yourself where you're at have radical acceptance of whatever situation you're in and then visualize how you want it to be and work from there so that's i believe that's powerful i love that i don't think any guest has ever said that before and it's so simple and so true yeah that is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saying that, Dr. Tabitha. And Thank you for having me on. Oh, absolutely. And we'll definitely have you back on because there's so much more that we can talk about. We will put all of your links in the show notes of how people can find you and connect with you. But yeah, let people know where they can, can find you verbally and then we'll put all the links down there. Yeah. So the best way is just on my website, Dr. Tabitha, D-R-T-A-B-A-T-H-A, no eyes. My mom spelled it wrong. Um, <laughs> but that's where you can like sign up to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. You can do my group seven-week group challenge. I'll, you know, you can find my podcast link, all that kind of stuff. So, and follow me on social. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time and your information. I absolutely love this and we will definitely have you back on. Sounds good. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed this episode. As always, please share this episode and check out the entire Thyroid Fixer podcast on all podcast platforms. If you're on iTunes, it would be awesome if you left me a review. And just a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast is not intended to diagnose or treat. So you always want to check with your doctor about any advice given on this podcast. And if you'd like to schedule a discovery call, please refer to the show notes for all the links. Everything that we talked about in the podcast will be in there with a guide for you on how you can get your life back. Let's get you fixed.